my name is Lancelot like August and uh, this dramatic arts lesson is for grade 11 and it's powered by the Amatkawe collection uh, collective <laughs> sorry so I've been feeling a bit under the weather but I thought that I should make this series on South African theater um, and it's quite a few sessions that will be handling with this grade 11 topic of of dramatic arts um, uh, social uh, of South African theaters uh, 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 in the session specifically, we'll be looking at the socio-political context of South African theatre, in other words, the social and the political context that formed South African theatre. So essentially, in today's session, <clears throat> we'll be looking, I'll be giving you a bit of a context of, 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 of South African theatre, and then also I'll be explaining to you in depth the genealogy of South African theatre. The genealogy refers to a timeline of um, South African theatre, and that refers to South African theatre. Um, uh, I'll be taking you through the genealogy of South African theatre from the period 6000 uh, before Common Era to um, the 1990s. Um, and I think it's quite an interesting uh, lesson. I think that I think that you will really, really enjoy it. I mean, history is always boring, but <clears throat> to think about the history of theatre is actually uh, something very, very, very uh, interesting. Um, so yeah, let's uh, get straight to it. Let me just I'm um, navigating multiple screens here, so I just need to bring up all of my um, yeah, all of my <laughs> points. Because um, I am explaining to you from um, my annotated notes, so I want to have all the points there so as I navigate between the screens. So, um, <clears throat> essentially, uh, uh, yeah, so essentially South Africa is a country of diversity and South Africa has always been a country of uh, diversity. Uh, it's, it's a country of diverse landscapes and people, uh, diverse, la uh, diverse languages, diverse cultures, and it's basically this diversity that has brought about a a uh, rich blend of, of cultures and um, it's also led to communication barriers which which might have uh, um, inhibited our ability to be creative with each other because when we come together and we bring our diverse cultures together it could form a very very great performance product um, so basically uh, the political history of our country has has resulted in uh, separation and isolation of people. Uh, theater um, has a, a long-standing history of reflecting what exactly these divides are, but it's also a powerful communication um, channel. It, it, it bridges barriers and it forges links between cultures, it forges links towards uh, between communities. It brings us together. So. Basically, today, theatre needs to speak across language and cultural barriers, and it needs to reflect the diversity in 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 our country. Um, there are a lot of plays that 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 do this, um, uh, such as um, William Kentridge's Faustus in Africa. You can go and have a look at it. Um, uh, Upu van der Merwe that was created by or directed by Lucille um, Gilwald. Also Love, Crime and Johannesburg, a favorite play of mine that was um, <clears throat> that was uh, uh, created by the Junction Avenue Theatre Company. Big Dada by Brett Bailey, which is a practitioner who still practices today. Also the jazz art production of media. And this form of theatre is uh, designated... Um, of called crossover theater uh, uh, by 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 Temple Houtflesh, who is also a leading uh, theater um, <clears throat> South African theater researcher. So basically, this um, alongside this topic, you will be studying a South African uh, play, and it will be interesting because you'll be able to put the research or rather the the the, the chronology of of South African theater into context uh, within the play that you are studying. You'll be able to locate. The play's position in history and possibly forge some ideas as to why it was written, what the playwright was going for, what the playwright was commenting on, etc. <clears throat> so let's get straight into it. Um, so, ish. So basically, the first um, period that we are starting at is 6,000 um, years um, uh, before Common Era, and this was um, <coughs> uh, uh, the, the, the Khoisan 
tribes were around back then. And um, the Khoisan tribe was known to be um, one of the earliest known um, inhabitants of South Africa. Um, they are also known for their brilliant hunting techniques and their uh, renowned uh, artworks, rock paintings and things like that. But it was also a, a, a tribe that, that um, did a lot of um, ritualistic dance and um, uh, and it, um, the ritualistic dance that they did was tribe dancing, which was basically dance in which dance the dancer enters this heightened state of of consciousness, and this is represented visually by 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 the rock paintings. So there's a marriage between two art forms there. Storytelling was also important. Um, um, a particular good story that was that, that was around at that time was the story of the hunt be, uh, being enacted by the hunter on his return to the clan um, and stories involving the gods, especially the trickster god or Kachin, as 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 um, Khoisan people know their god as. And um, <clears throat> so basically storytelling uh, had a dramatic function in society. And then also um, the Khoi Khoi um, shepherds or herders, as they are called, moved into the area um, at around the time of Christ. And um, the music was, was was, and the, and then they had a, a music role to play, or they contributed towards society musically. The music was highly developed. They used voices, um, drums, and flutes, and and different kind of string instruments. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> then um, the next period that we are looking at is the the. Um, Guni tribes uh, um, in the period 300, um, 300 in the common, the year 300 in the common era. We live in the common era, by the way. Um, <clears throat> so basically, um, uh, here we are looking at, um, the, it was the Iron Age, and we're looking at uh, uh, the Guni tribes then uh, lived a settled, uh, um, they lived a settled village life. They uh, were using means of production um, to get by, such as they were using, they were doing the production of metal tools, pottery and crafts. But what was important about this um, tribe or this era was that they had a rich oral culture and this culture was passed um, down through from generation to generation. And uh, while it's important to 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 um, reconstruct exactly all the indi indigenous oral performance forms as they must have first existed, it's impossible to gain a sense of the diversity of 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 the forms because they've evolved over the large centuries. So it's important. What's important to know about these oral traditional oral performance forms is that they are usually communal in nature, um, that they include um, dramatic festivals, rituals, and celebrations, and all of them are associated with particular song, dance, music, costumes, as well as praise poetry, which you might have done in grade eight or nine dramatic um, creative arts, and also diverse storytelling forms. So these are the, the arts forms or uh, the performance forms that were uh, around in, in the Nguni tribes. Now here comes the, 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 the contentious, um, the 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 contentious ones, which was um, the um, the 1652 and um, the Dutch East India Company. Um, this period, very difficult period, because particularly concerned with the um, onset of colonization in South Africa, as well as um, yeah. So basically. Uh, during this period, the, the Dutch East India Company came to set up a refreshment station at the Cape, and this is when the period of the process of colonization began. Um, they uh, followed Calvinistic principles, and because of that, there would be no public entertainment, and the printing press um, <clears throat> um, was also banned. So there was no printed media allowed. Um, and also um, Dutch settlers uh, believed that uh, entertainment <coughs> was uh, to be the work of the devil. Important to note here is that slaves were important from uh, India, from Eastern Asia, from Madagascar and from parts of Africa. And it's them that brought with from <coughs> those places, they brought the traditions, including musical skills, which were often highly developed. And that is how there was a sense of performativity and uh, performance during this period. And 
The next area or era that I'm uh, moving towards is the era of, um, yeah, the era of uh, the arrival of the French in the Cape uh, and then also British settlers. So basically in the, in the period 1700s, uh, French settlers, they came to the Cape to escape a religious persecution from France. Um, the first record of a theatre production uh, that were, or the theatre tradition is of French soldiers who performed amateur productions of well-known plays at the time. They performed it with all male casts. Um, an important person to note here is Charles Boniface, uh, who was the director of a French amateur company at the time, and also the first person to write South African scripts using South African characters, uh, and it used the Afrikaans dialect of the time. So this was a very, uh, a, 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 a very key note, uh, a shift in, 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 uh, South African theater history. Um, French settlers coming here and using, um, and being some of the first people to, um, uh, write South African scripts with South African characters using a South African language. Basically, when the Brit, when the Cape became a British colony in 1795, um, this was when these traditions of theater was expanded. And you'll see, um, uh, the first theater building was the African theater, which stands to this day. It's now the St. Stephen's Church, uh, in Rivik Square, uh, Cape Town. Uh, and it opened in 1801 with a production of Shakespeare's Henry the Fourth. Um, yeah, and it still stands today. Um, yeah, I think I've passed this church many times. I think it's there in the Greenpoint area. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I might be mistaken. I actually need to follow up. Um, so <clears throat> important to note that during this time, uh, performances were were of of indigenous cultures were exoticized, and this exoticization continued for a very very long time. Um, in 1820, there was a new group of British settlers who came, and they, <coughs> sorry, they came more aggressively, and they wanted to create this buffer between the colony and the rest of Southern Africa, and this was when wars started to come between the Kosa and, and the British settlers, and they started to fight over cattle, and they started to fight over land rights, and um, important to note here that mission schools were established during this period, and with the idea of mission schools came the idea of, 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 um, a literary theater or the study of Shakespeare and other playwrights in the school curriculum. Um, also what happened during this time was that um, uh, the first original South African theater piece was identified and it was written by Annie Geeds, Annie Geeds Baines and it was called um, Kachi Kekelbeck uh, or Life Among the uh, Hot and Tot. Um, and it was first performed in 1838, and it was first performed by the Grahamstown Amateur Company. So uh, it's important to note that during this period, the British also had an influence in uh, the the kind of tradition that came to um, the kind of tradition, theatre tradition that uh, that is now known in South Africa. And it was the British that brought vaudeville, musical, and classics to the theatre um, uh, buildings. And it sprang up in all the major centers. And also at around this time, the first local theater on um, entrepreneurs start to, uh, started to make money from, from, from theater. This is an interesting period that we are now looking at. We are looking um, <clears throat> at um, the genealogy of South African theater, specifically in the 1900s. And this period was demarcated as uh, the rise of African and nationalism. So during this period, the, the British discriminated against the Dutch um, and this gave rise to um, <coughs> the birth of Afrikaner nationalism and the desire of them to defend this new language. So early Afrikaans theater was mainly made up of patriotic pieces, um, mainly about the Anglo-Boer war, you know, speaking about heroes of the war and things like that. Um, and in, it's interesting to note that after the Anglo-Boer War, there was a push towards the unification of South Africa. This was particularly in the area um, 1910. And also in 1925, Afrikaans was first recognized as, as, as an official second language. Of course, the first language was English. Um, uh, in this period, Afrikaans theater began to take off. Um, touring companies started visiting the rural population and a sort of Afrikaans literary tradition started to emerge. It was demanded and it was encouraged. Um, 
<coughs> but English theatre was still around, don't make no mistake. Um, the first locally born English play that was Stephen Black. Uh, and, and Stephen Black wrote plays with recognizable South African content or characters and dialect. And these, and, and, and Steve was known for writing plays that were mainly um, satirical in, in nature. So that's also very important to note. Now we're moving into more of recent times, though not recent, we're looking at about 100 years ago. In the period 1920s, um, what was um, interesting was um, the use of um, drama in education. And um, this was particularly done by missionaries who made an important contribution to theatre by using drama in education. In the 1920s, uh, there was the father, uh, Bernard Haas, who was a teacher at a missionary school who um, encouraged his students to dramatize Zulu narratives. And um, uh, the first group of, of black professional, uh, um, the first group of black professional um, that was made up of black theater professionals were um, was led by Iso, uh, a teacher named Iso Mtetwa, and he formed Mtetwa's Lucky Stars, and they began to tour their productions about Zulu culture. Another land shift or shifting mark or landscape shift in, in South African theater was um, <clears throat> um, the first black playwright, uh, H.I.E. Dlomo, who, who, um, who published plays in English. And he is known as the propagator or the instigator of, of African drama. And he, through his work, he challenged colonial domination through plays like um, um, The Girl Who Killed to Save. Uh, many of you would know it as uh, the story of Unon um, Kause. Yeah. So um, that was Lomo's work, and 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 through that work, Lomo challenged colonial domination. But of course, there were other things that were happening politically um, in in townships, particularly like Sophia Town. Sophia Town was a cultural melting pot. There was hangout spots for musicians, writers, gangsters, and. Sophia Town um, uh, uh, contributed towards the South African performance context by. Um, uh, 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 developing some sort of eclectic performance culture that drew on American English and American cultural traditions. And in Sophia Town, uh, there was a lot of comic sketches and acting happening as well as jazz performances, as well as singing and dancing and things like that. Um, and then now more on the political side, um, of the National Party came into power in 1948. And with this came the provision of state funding for the theater and the establishment of the National Theatre Organization. So um, the National Theatre Organization was a bilingual touring company uh, uh, and it performed plays uh, in the tradition and didn't uh, allow for black uh, creative participation. It, however, did encourage Afrikaans indigenous theatre tradition. However, one of the main drawbacks of, of <clears throat> of the National Theatre Organization was that it uh, uh, main, main, most of the plays that were performed were performed in English, but not in South, but not by South Africans. And about four out of 40 plays that they performed, only about five or four of them, four or five of them were uh, performed in English, but by South Africans. So that's, so that's interesting to know. Um, in the 1950s, um, we are going to start noting community resistance uh, uh, to apartheid um, and theater was used to reflect um, uh, the responses to social realities of, of the time. We are looking at um, the onset of apartheid and, and um, legislation. So there were a few um, hectic laws that came into power here. First one was the Prohib Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act, which meant that you could not marry outside of your race. There's also the Immorality Amendment Act. The Immorality Act specifically looked at um, sexual relations with people outside of your race. Um, race. Um, the Group Areas Act, which um, demarcated certain portions of land to white people and everyone else had to, they were settled in other places um, nearby. Um, the Bantu Education Act, um, which spoke to people having to be taught, black people having to be taught in Afrikaans and things like that. Also, past laws, which we know, and um, the Native uh, Resettlement Act, um, <clears throat> which basically forced black people to move to homelands. Um, 
so in 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 19 it was in the area of 1950s when these seeds of apartheid were sown and all of these laws is what created the framework uh for the separation of oppression uh that would ensue um <clears throat> the 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 native resettlement act is uh and also the 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 um group areas act is what um <coughs> paved the way for the forced removals of uh, people from Sophia town and district six and um in 1955, in Clipton, the Freedom Charter was signed, which was one of which, which was one of the first clear signs of a, of a resistance culture against apartheid. So basically, with urbanization, more people moving to the city, um, or people moving away from the city, many traditional performance forms were adapted. And they were uh, evolved into new forms with. Um, some strong American influences, and during this period, a lot of cross-cultural um, collaborations took place, uh, like the Union Artist. And interesting enough about the Union Artist, there was an actor, director, and teacher, sorry, <clears throat> called um, Cedric Solomon um, Rahilo. And uh, he was asked about his time working with the Union Artists uh, at Dorkey House. Um, and uh, he said that 1958 was known as as the golden year for showbiz because of Dorkey House. We'll do Dorkey House in one of the next sessions. Um, <clears throat> and black prospective actors aspiring to be professionals found themselves in a haven where white theater practitioners were were uh, prepared to impart their knowledge. And people like Ethel Fugard, Bess Finney, uh, Leon Gluckman, and... Uh, um, and other people um, offered <coughs> uh, <coughs> and helped to nurture these talents, uh, which uh, would have a lasting influence over the next um, few decades that were to come. And rightfully so, because the next few decades were rough. If we look at the 1960s, oh, there was a lot that happened during the 1960s. Um, so basically, in 1960, there was just a, a whole lot of uh, political uh events uh that happened um uh so in 1960 we all know the sharpville massacre um happened and it was a watershed for south africa because sharpville led to the killing of 69 people by the police then the first state of emergency was declared and the anc and the pac were banned um in the next year 1961 south africa declared itself a republic because it withdrew from the commonwealth um the anc abandoned its non-violent policy and they set up umkonto we Sizo, which was an armed military wing um uh, mandela and other activists were sent into life imprisonment in the 1963 ravonia trials and this meant that most of the leadership of the anc was either in exile and in prison but what was important to note that during this time um the south Af the international press or the media became more critical of south africa's stance on race and various measures were taken one of these proudly um profoundly affected theater and that is um in 1963 the british um equity boycott was announced and this boycott <clears throat> prevented South Africans from performing British plays and British performers from performing in South Africa. Now, this basically meant that South African theatre practitioners had to create um, indigenous works to fill this gap. And this is where you saw the emergence of Gibson Kente and Ethel, uh, Ethel Fugard because they became established writers and directors. But there were also other initiatives like um, in Durban, Ronnie Govender founded the Shaw Theatre Company in, in the Shaw Theatre Company in 1964 that aimed to train um, young actors and uh, writers. Um, Govender uh, wrote a play called The Lachni's Pressure, The Lani's Pressure, uh, Pleasure, but refused to perform it. Um, in establishment venues because of, of of a cultural boycott also significant in this in the 1960s um the there was a period of of state subsidized theater with four performing arts councils being established in 1962 so there were four provinces in south africa and each province had a performing arts council so basically um, uh, um, state control over the content of productions became more intensive and also the publications control board um, enforced strict censorship rules so this meant that plays were banned for containing blasphemy and unpleasant subject matter and in 1965 all racially mixed cast <coughs> and audiences were banned um plays like um few playwrights like fugard had to produce unicultural plays and kente had to um 
rely solely on, on township audiences. So things were rough, but it was very significant what happened in the 1960s. In the 1970s, um, things went a step uh, further. Uh, and we're looking at uh, black consciousness theater, which 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 um, happened uh, during this time. So basically, black consciousness is a, a political philosophy that affirms the the black identity and dignity in the face of apartheid. And uh, black consciousness theater uh, was sparked by, <coughs> or rather, the political climate of South Africa reached its peak during the 1970s. I would say because of the death of Steve Biko, there was also the 1976 protests, um, and. Uh, all of this led to resistance and pressure against the apartheid government. Um, experimental plays, workshop plays, uh, uh, exploring African um, myths, legends, and cultures uh, all came to the fore um, during this period. Um, and 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 all of these uh, uh, led to more black theater groups being formed. Um, but those black theater groups were also um, ended due to political harassment and detention. There was a group called PIT or the People's Experimental Theater Group, which also disintegrated because its leaders were charged with treason. And um, um, also during this time, the worker and trade union struggle intensified. So theater became a very important way to... to um, to voice the protests that were banned from the streets and banned from the political uh, platform. So now you can see, learners, how protests formed a very critical part. Government hated protests and government, and it was basically safer though not to stage a protest in, in, in theater through artistic works than to go and stage a protest in the street, if that makes sense. Um, there were some spaces that enabled the creation of these works or that performed cutting edge works that were barn briakursh, as they would call it in Afrikaans, in the industry. And here we are looking at um, the space in Cape Town, also the market in Johannesburg and the Baxter, and um, a lot of other community theater and workers theater groups that looked at plays that explored prison, the, the plight of domestic workers, the role of black women in the struggle, you know, detention without trial, security police harassment, and also the trauma that were experienced by um, black policemen specifically. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, this led to the 1980s where apartheid literally reached its peak. Um, so basically, um, there were so many radical protests against apartheid in the 1980s, and this is what led to um, uh, multiple states of emergency. Um, so agitprop theater or uh, protest theater was used to mobilize the uh, the mobilize the oppressed uh, to fight against the the oppression, and basically during this time, a lot of anti-establishment and experimental practitioners came forward and started exploring with with techniques to make a protest theater, and there were even some. Afrikaans playwrights who, who openly uh, uh, went against apartheid in the creation of their works. Um, so basically, also uh, during this time, uh, during this time, uh, 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 cult, uh, cross-cultural workshop theater at places like the Market Theater. Uh, was happening and this explored South African issues and characters and also during this time there was a move towards exploring the ideas of experimental and international directors such as Kratowski, um, Brecht, uh, Brook and Arto but within a, in a, in a South African um, <coughs> context. Um, and this gave rise to, if I could think of some productions like Sophia Town. Uh, it was originally created in the mid 1980s. Um, it was strong. This production was strongly influenced by both the township and the musical, township musical, and also the ideas of Brecht. And it depicts basically the forced removals and destruction of of Sophia Town. So that was the 1980s. Now we move on to our last era, which is the 1990s. Um, so basically. Towards the end of the 1980s, there was a move towards um, negotiating with the release of Nelson Mandela from prison. And that happened. Um, also, in the 1990s, the ANC was unbanned. We see radical shifts like the first democratic elections being held in 1994. Um, and now, 
we can't see theater of resistance anymore. Now we, because what are we resisting against? We are free, there's no more apartheid, everything is fair, or is it? Theater practitioners then saw the need to use the protest theater techniques, but to explore um, <clears throat> new issues such as rape and incest and AIDS and education and the lack of housing and service delivery and things like that. So the techniques that people in the 70s and 80s used are still very relevant in the 90s, although it was used for slightly different purpose. Um, we also saw the evolution of theater forms such as um, theater for reconciliation, physical theater, new experimental theater techniques that were embraced in the 1990s. And um, the focus here uh, became um, interpreting classics from uh, um, uh, the South African perspective. And in the 1990s, we're looking at, at um, a play specifically in this context as um, Ubu and the Truth Commission, uh, which comes from the legend of Ubu Roy. Um, so that is a classic that was reinterpreted to sort of depict in a diverse uh, uh, puppetry sort of production the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings that happened in the period 1996, etc. Um, uh, in the 1990s, we didn't only see a diversity or a embracing of diverse theatre forms, but we also saw a change in technique. We saw a fusion of techniques and media, and we saw multilingualism being used in theatre and things like that. I know this was a mouthful, but think about all of these, um, the genealogy of South Africa, um, of, of South African theatre from way back when to how it is now. You're obviously doing a play and, and, and uh, uh, that, you, that you are doing with your teacher. And I want to know, just as an exploration activity for you, locate the play that you are studying within the history of South Africa. Ask yourself the question, in what period was it written? In what period was it performed? What sort of spaces was it performed in? What part of South African history informs the content of the play? What are the themes of the play? And then in a few, it might take some research, but in a few paragraphs, just reflect uh, on the, the statement that I'm about to read to you in relation to the play that you are studying. And the statement is, a play is always a reflection of its time Social, political, economic, and theatrical influences all have their expression in theater. Think about that in relation to the historiography of theater that I just gave you. How do you see the play that you are studying within the time that it was written? How do the things fit in? Reflect on that, and if you want to share it, please share um, what you wrote and stuff in, in the comments um, of this video. Uh, in the next uh, video, uh, I'll be looking at part of um, <clears throat> the next section of the work according to curriculum, and we'll be looking at the construction of a theater space, um, specifically uh, South African theater spaces, and I'll be looking at what a theatrical space is, and we'll also be reflecting on some of the key theater spaces in South Africa. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for joining me. My name is Lancelot August, and I just brought you a lesson in grade 11, Dramatic Arts, and was brought to you by the Amat Kawe Collective, a non-profit organization that strives to create theater for change.